and off we go. Uh, so like I said, this is CO2-based demand control ventilation brought to you by NICOR Gas Energy Smart Program. Um, why is that not working with my mouse? All right, my mouse is working. So ventilation control. Um, comfort in a particular space is more than just the temperature of the space. Everybody obviously thinks of that. And if I was to quiz you guys, which I will do later on, by the way, for you guys that need PDH questions, um, people would also probably tell me humidity is important. But very few people ever say things like ventilation air or sound quality or any of those other type of things. There are, in fact, lots of things that are involved in a space being comfortable to the occupants. We have an entire standard at ASHRAE, ASHRAE Standard 55, that will dictate to you what makes people comfortable. But it's a factor of things, temperature, humidity, air motion, sound, acoustics, and ventilation is part of that discussion. So we're going to focus on that piece of it today in ventilating buildings correctly. So how is ventilation provided in buildings today? Basically, it's provided the same way it's always been. Um, someone dictates to us a fixed amount of outside air we have to bring in. Generally, that's dictated by mechanical or ventilation codes for particular towns. We bring in that fixed amount of air. Everybody's happy. Life goes on. But all that fixed ventilation is based on the building be, being occupied at the maximum, which it seldom is. So there's a lot of waste involved in that. And CO2-based demand control ventilation is specifically designed to reduce that overventilation waste. Ventilation rates over time have fluctuated. Uh, here's kind of a historical ASHRAE 62 look at ventilation rates. You can kind of skip that giant pyramid at the beginning. If you're working on buildings that haven't been updated in that long, uh, those are pretty old buildings. But most of your buildings are built uh, or last rehabbed, um, obviously after World War II, and most of them probably in the 70s, 80s, 90s, last time they were rehabbed. For the longest time, we had 10 CFM of outside air required per person, and that lasted on through the 70s when we had the energy crisis. I already freaked out. So at ASHRAE, we cut the ventilation rates in half. And um, that's a little dip you see there for 1981. Uh, that was very short-lived because that was not sufficient ventilation for buildings, and we started having sick building syndrome and issues like that. So at ASHRAE, we overreacted the other way, and we tripled the rate in 1989, up to 15 CFM per person. Then eventually we jumped to 20, and now it kind of hovers around 17. I say kind of because in 2004, we stopped having a fixed amount, and we switched it to a per person plus per square foot amount. So instead of having 20 CFM per person for an office building, which this chart is based on, we now have a rate um, of 5 CFM per person plus 0 0.06 CFM per square foot. And you add those two together. But for a typical office building density, that averages out to about 17 CFM per person, which is why we showed it this way on the graph. So kind of the point of this is that if you're rehabbing a building now, uh, chances are the ventilation rates are different than what they were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when you originally built it. So when you rehab the building, you're probably going to have to bring in more outside air than you used to have to bring in. But you probably don't want to spend more energy to do that. So a typical building, if it was based on that older code at 20 CFM per person, if we had this little bank project here and we had 25 people in that designed to be in that space, we'd have to bring in 500 CFM of outside air. But then later on in the day, if there's only five people in there, we would still bring in the 500. And at night, when this lady's counting the money by herself, which is probably not the best idea, uh, we'd still be bringing 500 CFM of air. The building and the system have no idea how many people are in there. Hence, it doesn't know how much outside air to bring in. So it always brings in the code required design amount. So that's what we need to change here. By the way, I'm going to mention at this point, if you guys have questions that you would like me to answer, feel free to type them in that same question chat box. Um, and then that way, as, uh, as you guys are answering the quiz questions, I can be reading off you know, questions you have for me at the same time. So if we have a zoning system, such as a VAV type system, uh, we'd have dampers in all those particular zones. And what would happen on those type of projects is we would still ventilate for the maximum number of occupants to be brought into those zones at all times. Uh, there's two problems with that, obviously. Um, if rooms are unoccupied, we're still ventilating them because the code told us we were supposed to. And then the second part of that puzzle is that as we slow the VFD down on a VAV system, we are inadvertently bringing less outside air in through the outside air intake. So we could be underventilating at certain points of time because of that. 
when my mouse wasn't want to cooperate. Um, so in this particular drawing, spaces in blue are overventilated, orange is underventilated. Nothing's ideally ventilated because we made this drawing to scare you. Um, but for the most part, very few spaces would get the exact amount of air they need. It probably would be fairly unbalanced. The idea we're going to talk about today, though, is to not only have a temperature sensor for every zone, whether it's constant volume or VAV, but to have a temperature sensor plus a ventilation sensor to indicate how much outside air is coming into that particular space. So then we can know if we need to bring in less outside of the building, more outside of the building, shove more of it to one zone versus the other zone. If we don't measure what's going on, we can't control it. So in all the products you probably worked on in the past, we're only controlling temperature and we're ignoring everything else, including ventilation. What we'd like to start doing now is controlling that ventilation. When I say we'd like to start doing it now, I think I did my first CO2 system in 2000, which is 16 years ago. It wasn't even allowed by code back then. I mean, it wasn't prohibited, but it wasn't allowed either. Uh, we'll talk about that as we talk about code down here. So it's not like this is a new cutting edge technology. It's just uh, something that was underutilized mainly because a lot of systems didn't have DDC controls, they had pneumatics, but now everybody's got DDC. So that's what we're going to do is control the systems for temperature and ventilation, and in some projects, humidity and other factors as well. So the idea is to get the right amount of fresh air to the right zone at the right time. So how do we actually do that? So one thing is to understand what's involved in knowing where the people are at. Um, CO2 levels in the space are a good indicator of the ventilation rate for the space. In fact, that's pretty much all they're good for. Unless you're in a manufacturing plant that's producing CO2 and you have some concerns about that, other than that kind of project, the only thing you can use a CO2 sensor for in a space is to decide if you're bringing the right amount of ventilation air per person. That's all it does, and we'll explain that. It at no point in time tells you whether the air quality is good or bad. It has no indicator of that. CO2 is not an indicator of indoor air quality. I could bring in more fresh air from outside and that air might not be fresh. It could be completely polluted because I'm sucking it next to the dumpster. Um, it does not indicate the quality of the air. It just indicates the quantity of fresh air relative to the people in the space consuming that air. And we'll explain that in pretty good detail. Uh, the standards and codes all understand this now. ASHRAE 62.1 is our ventilation standard for the country. International Mechanical Code is kind of piggybacked off that. They both have provisions for this. 90.1 is our energy standard. International Energy Conservation Code piggybacks off of that. They both have provisions for this. It's pretty well established now that you can use CO2 sensors in people-based occupancies to indicate the ventilation rate and hence adjust it. CO2 is not a contaminant by any means in a normal building. Um, you can get up to levels of 30,000 parts per million before you had any health concerns really to think about. Um, I've never seen a building go above 2,000 parts per million. Um, I've never been able to get one of my handheld sensors to go near 30,000. Uh, I've sat there breathing directly on the sensor itself, and I only can get up in the 5,000s, although I did have one lady who was able to get up into the 8,000s. But story is you can't get CO2 levels in the building so high that it's going to be a health risk unless it's some kind of weird manufacturing facility that produces CO2. So it's not a contaminant. It's not dangerous in the built environment. Um, However, it does sound a lot like CO, carbon monoxide. And I cannot tell you how many people confuse these two things, um, including professional engineers all the time. I see carbon monoxide sensors on the drawing in an office building. I'm like, what are you doing with the CO sensor? Oh, that's just to, to change the ventilation rate. I'm like, oh, you meant CO2. You forgot the two. It's a big difference, right? That extra oxygen molecule makes all the difference. So uh, CO2 and CO both sound the same. They're both colorless, odorless, both naturally found. Um, but carbon monoxide is, is a hazardous one, and it's a byproduct of incomplete combustion. CO2, perfectly safe. In fact, you exhale CO2 every minute. Um, the good news is that people exhale CO2 out of their body at very predictable rates. Um, we know what those rates are for humans at different uh, activity levels, so we can use that to determine ventilation strategies. So, for example, on this particular chart here, uh, this is a graph. Up the vertical side of the graph is your CO2 production from humans. Uh, across the bottom of the graph on the horizontal axis is your metabolic rate, so your activity level. The more active you are, the more things you're doing physically, the more you breathe, and hence the more CO2 you produce. So, for example, if you're sitting at an office, you're at a met level of basically 1.2, and you're producing 0.3 liters per minute of CO2. 
But if you're running on the treadmill, heavy exercise, you have a met rate of four. So you're up there around uh, one liter per minute of CO2 production. So basically four times the amount of activity level is basically four times the amount of CO2 production. Additionally, the CO2 production is directly correlated to the number of people. If I double the amount of people in the space, I'm going to double the CO2 production. If I triple it, I triple the CO2 production. That's going to become very beneficial to us as we talk about tracking this off your ventilation rates. I often get the question on, well, how long does it take for the CO2 sensor to detect people coming into the space? Um, detecting how long they come into space is a little bit different than reaching a stable equilibrium. Um, to get the space to an equilibrium, a constant CO2 level, uh, it takes a certain amount of time for the people to be in the space and specifically how much outside air I'm bringing into the space. So if I was using the traditional 20 CFM per person ventilation rate, uh, you can see it's probably going to take on the graph here 45 minutes before I get to a stable level of CO2 production. So people all come into the conference room, they start breathing in the conference room. After 45 minutes, the CO2 level hits a certain point and it kind of just stays there unless people come or go or unless they start doing jumping jacks in the conference room. However, if I was ventilating at a much lower ventilation rate, perhaps 5 CFM per person, uh, it might take me two and a half hours to get to a stable equilibrium. And that doesn't mean we wait two and a half hours to start controlling the ventilation system. That sensor within a few minutes is going to pick up the changes in CO2, and as we start seeing the CO2 level increase, we'll start increasing the ventilation rate. We don't wait till we get to some tipping point and then say, oh crap, and open up the ventilation damper. We modulate it smoothly as the CO2 level is going up or down. So it's pretty quick reacting. Um, so if we were to take that same little bank project and we were to use a CO2 sensor on the wall to indicate how many people were in the space producing CO2, on our project, if we had the full 25 people in there, we'd be bringing in the code required 500 CFM. However, when there's only five people in there, we would modulate the ventilation damper back below the code minimum down to, in this case, 100 CFM based on that particular code. And if it's just the one lady by herself, we'd throttle it back to 20 CFM. Now, in practice, we're probably never going to bring it down to 20 CFM because there are other reasons to have outside air coming into a building other than ventilation. We oftentimes need it for pressurization control. So if somewhere in this little bank there's a bath fan uh, running at 100 CFM, I'm not going to want to bring the outside air intake down below 100 CFM. So we'll have those kind of minimums in, in the system control as well. It won't be just based on people alone, but that'll be the driving factor. Uh, Mike just sent in our first question. Um, Mike asks, are all sensors equally sensitive as directed by code? I'm not sure exactly what Mike's asking there. Uh, I don't, the code doesn't specify the sensitivity level required of the sensor. Uh, it just specifies when you're required to use it. And we'll talk about the code here in a little bit. Um, I would say all sensors from all manufacturers are not equally sensitive but I would say it's close enough that you would never know the difference. Uh, and by that, I mean the sensitivity, like we're talking about here, like how fast is my sensor going to react? It's not so much a function of the sensor itself. It's really a function of the volumetric space of the room uh, and the production rates of the people in the room. Um, so if I take 10 people and I stick them in my little office here, which is whatever it is, 10 by 10, um, that sensor is going to sense that CO2 very rapidly versus if 10 of us go out in the warehouse and start breathing, it's probably never going to sense it. So it's really more of a function of the space. We'll talk about the application of how, how many sensors you need for what kind of spaces. But most manufacturers will tell you that their sensor can handle about uh, 5,000 square feet. That's a pretty common specification. Or some of them will do it based on radius and say you can, it can handle a 20 or 25 foot radius um, and have sensitivity. Um, Davis asks, if a CO2 sensor fails, how do you know that it failed? Um, if the sensor is on a building automation system, um, generally speaking, at least when I did building automation, I would set up um, thresholds on the building automation system to sell, if, say if the CO2 sensor reading drops below a certain number or goes above a certain number, I want to be alarmed on that because uh, those numbers would be unrealistic to happen in space. For example, if I see a CO2 sensor reading of 350 parts per million, I know that that's impossible. It can't drop below the outside air level, um, so I can alarm on that. Likewise, if it gets higher, typically 10% higher than my set point, I'll alarm on that because either that means the sensor is broken or it means that the ventilation system is broken uh, in either case. Uh, all right, last question, then we'll move on a little bit. Tom asks, what's the typical life of a CO2 sensor and what's the calibration interval? 
And Tom, I'm going to use that as a teaser because we're going to talk about that quite a bit towards the end today. All right, let's get back up to where we were. All right, so if we actually start measuring, measuring the ventilation rates based on CO2 in individual spaces, we can modulate their VAV dampers to make sure that those spaces get the right amount of air intake. Uh, we will still pay attention to temperature, obviously, and we won't throttle above and below that. And we'll kind of explain how that works here in a little bit. Uh, if I have a constant volume system, it becomes significantly easier because only one damper to modulate, which is the outside air intake. Uh, generally, to do this on a VAV system, you need to have DDC controls. In fact, I shouldn't say generally. You have to have DDC controls to do this on a VAV system. For a constant volume rooftop or air handler, you could just have the CO2 sensor directly driving the economizer, and you don't need robust DDC controls. But for a zoning system, this is the way you have to do it. The CO2 sensor would be per VAV box or specifically per VAV box controller and reporting back to that controller and modulating that damper more or less based on the occupancy. Then the air handler controller is going to need to look back at all of the VAV controllers to see if any of them are unable to achieve the desired CO2 set point on their own by modulating just their zone damper. And if they cannot achieve the set point, and the main air handler will have to open up the outside air intake more. So let's look at our first quiz question. As a reminder, if you need PDHs for professional engineering recertifications, you need to answer the questions in the polls that we have today. Uh, and you need to answer, I think it's 60% uh, of them correctly. They're not hard questions. They're just basically indicating that you're here, alive, breathing, and paying attention, or at least half paying attention. So make sure you answer those questions. If you don't need PDH hours, that's fine. You're welcome to answer the questions anyway. Uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of fun, at least as fun as you know, game shows are. All right. So our first question, if I can get it to open up here, which I will get it to do. All right. Question number one. True or false, mechanical codes allow DCV systems to reduce the OA ventilation below the code required minimum. Jonathan asks, how do you answer these questions? Um, you should see on your screen a pop-up. Maybe you typed it in before I popped it up, uh, letting you choose true or false on that. And then once we get most folks answered, then we'll uh, we'll shut it down, and then we will uh, tell you the answer. All right, 81% of the people voted on there. I'm going to give it another five seconds. So if you haven't already done so, click true or false. Five, four, three, two. All right, I'm going to share the results with you. True or false mechanical codes allow DCV systems to reduce the OA ventilation below the code required minimum. The answer to that is true, and 58% of you got that correct which is a lot less than I was expecting, so I'm not sure what's up there. All right, Jen asks if we can email the slides. Uh, they're kind of big to email, but I could post them somewhere and send you guys a link. Um, so if you need that, just send me a note later because I'm not, I'm not taking notes while I'm broadcasting here. Send me a note later, and I will, I will do that for you. All right, we'll switch back over to our main screen. All right, I'm going to try to play this little video for you. I don't know how well it's going to broadcast due to the speed, but I'm going to give it a try just to see what happens, and I'm going to talk over it so you can kind of see what happens. This is on a small VAV system. Obviously, it's only a couple zones just for example purposes. We're only looking at this bottom room right here. These blades are the VAV box blades, and then your main air handler is back on the top left there. There's a CO2 sensor in this space. As people come into the space, they breathe more. The CO2 level will rise. That CO2 sensor will tell that VAV box to modulate more open. The video shows it going wide open, but it would modulate slowly based on the CO2 level. If people continue to come into that space and continue to breathe, the sensor will report back to the VAV box continuously saying, give me more, give me more. Once the VAV box is giving as much as it can, it'll then have to ask the air handler 
to start increasing the fractional outside air rate. Once again, the, the video shows it going wide open, but it would modulate slowly and incrementally to provide more ventilation air to that space. So whatever the worst case VAV box is, that particular screen, um, everybody's saying that the video didn't push through. That's what I was a little bit afraid of. Uh, sometimes videos speed through a webinar broadcast with hundreds of people doesn't work so smoothly. So we'll just pretend that that didn't happen. I uh, hope you enjoyed the black screen of that. Sorry about that. Um, but the VAV boxes would, um, the worst case VAV box with the highest CO2 level would be the one basically driving the outside air damper intake and everybody else be modulating less than that. Uh, there are tons of studies relating CO2 sensing, uh, CO2 levels in a space um, to productivity in a space. Uh, there's lots of studies for IAQ related to CO2 even though it's a surrogate. I'm not going to read you all those studies, but I'd be happy to get you info on any of them if you're super interested in it. Um, but CO2 is a well-established indicator of ventilation rates in a space, and higher ventilation tends to lead to higher productivity. Productivity in offices is generally throughput, and productivity in schools is generally uh, grades. Um, so the ventilation rates do dictate that. But on the flip side, you don't want to ventilate more than you actually need to ventilate. Uh, Jameson types in a question, could you possibly be overcooling the zone if you separate airflow from space temperature rather than just go straight to the system OA damper control? Uh, so here's the thing um, that's very misunderstood about CO2, whether it's on a VAV system or on a constant volume system. Everyone seems to envision in their head that we're going to open up the outsider damper more than we would on a normal project, and hence we could have all these heating, cooling, or humidity issues. We only modulate the dampers back up to their code required minimum. So don't think of it as a CO2 sensor opening a damper. The CO2 sensor really closes a damper or modulates it towards closed when less people are in the space. So if everybody showed up to the space per the design, that damper or those dampers would basically go to where they would have been set on a job that didn't have a CO2 sensor to begin with. Um, that, that, that can cause overcooling, Jameson, just like it can cause overcooling on a non-CO2 sensor job. And if you have VAV boxes that need a high requirement of outdoor air ventilation rate, on those particular zones, it's not uncommon to put a tempering coil on there, hot water, electric, or something like that. Uh, although it's oftentimes not needed because the more people you have in a space breathing, obviously the more cooling you probably need. So those things kind of link together. So you probably it's probably not an issue in that regard. Um, I've never had a project where I've had to add any extra heat to a building because of CO2 sensors. In fact, we've had buildings where we've reduced the amount of reheat on certain coils because of the CO2 sensors. So it usually goes the other way around. Uh, so lots of studies here. Ventilation is, is an important aspect for building occupants. People care about ventilation rate. There's numerous studies that link all these things back up. Uh, this is one, is one of my favorites because it actually tells you what it really costs. So every dollar they spent in this particular Department of Energy study on improving ventilation in buildings save two dollars in sick time in the buildings. Um, I like that one because I highly doubt anyone's not using their sick days, so it probably didn't really save the money. Uh, but it was nice to not have your coworkers hacking all over you, I suppose. Uh, there are lots of CO2 applications in schools, and lots of schools have very poor air quality. It's actually frightening how bad the air quality is in some of these schools. Um, a study 11 years ago had 15,000 schools in the United States with indoor air quality that was rated as unfit to breathe. These are the schools that your kids go to. So not only does the CO2 sensor help you modulate back to save energy when everyone's not there, it also ensures that you're modulating the damper open far enough when people are there. There's lots of buildings that don't have the outside air intake set up correctly, and you have no way of knowing that on a normal job. Uh, after the air balancer leaves, whatever happens, happens, and nobody knows what's going on. If you have a CO2 sensor there, like I said earlier, you'll get alarms if the CO2 levels are too high or too low. So you'll know that there's something wrong either with the sensor or more likely with the damper itself. Uh, Chad says the pro problem is that most manufacturers don't control the economizer damper on RTU to code required minimum. They'll drive the damper 100% open so you need to trick the system and put it in a super high CO2 set point. Um, I'm not sure which manufacturers you're referring to. Obviously from my perspective I am familiar mostly with Carrier and Bryant. And I have been here 19 years, and in all those 19 years, we have used Honeywell economizer controllers on our rooftops that have CO2, set, CO2 inputs that allow modulation specifically and not going to a fixed position. 
However, prior to that, I retrofitted on units that did have old economizer controllers that had no ability to modulate based on CO2. Uh, every single rooftop that ships out of our office since I've worked here has the ability to fully modulate uh, and not go wide open and wide closed. Uh, additionally, um, when I do it with a DDC control system, in, which meaning I don't have a Honeywell economizer controller, I'm directly driving the economizer myself, in those particular cases, um, I will implement a maximum damper position opening. Actually, we do it on the Honeywell controllers too. So I won't go above the code required airflow for outside air. And if I do go on and go above code, I won't go more than 10%. Um, so let's say the code required on a particular product, I needed 20% outside air. I would lock the damper so in the CO2 driven mode, it can't go more than 30% open. Um, if there's an economizer call for free cooling, obviously you could do more then. Uh, so lots of studies with schools, um, increasing outdoor intake and decreasing temperature, improved speed. Um, fresh air is good. We just don't want any extra fresh air. Uh, CO2 is allowed by the mechanical codes. Um, that was not always the case. And when I first started installing these systems, that was not the case. I mean, it wasn't prohibited, but it wasn't allowed. It just wasn't addressed at all. Um, but ASHRAE 62.1 allows CO2-based demand control ventilation. That feeds into the International Mechanical Code, which also allows it, and that feeds into most of your local codes, uh, except for my friends from Chicago and Wisconsin on here. We'll talk about you guys separately. But everywhere else, that's pretty much how it works. This is the current language in ASHRAE 62.1 2013, and the same language is utilized in the IMC. And this language has basically remained unchanged since about 2004 four for ASHRAE and 2006 for IMC. It specifically calls out that you can have demand control ventilation systems uh, as a means of doing dynamic reset. It also only lists um, CO2 demand control ventilation as a, as a way to do it. Um, there's probably other ways you can do it, but that's the only one that's you know really listed out by name here. So it does allow you to change the breathing zone outdoor airflow rate dynamically, which means on demand throughout the day uh, to provide in less air when people are not there. So that's allowed by the mechanical codes. Uh, like I said, it's been an IMC uh, since 2016. It came as an interpretation originally, and now it's actually written into the actual code. So it was an interpretation in 2004, code language in 2006. For you guys up in Wisconsin, I know there's quite a few of you on here, so I threw this in here. Uh, there's always been a lot of debate on whether DCV was allowed in Wisconsin. The state ventilation department, or state mechanical department, I should say, was never a big fan of it because uh, there was always issues with determining what the minimum should be. Uh, plus, if you don't know, Wisconsin has significantly lower ventilation rates than anywhere else in the country. In fact, it's probably the lowest ventilation rates in the country, so there's not a lot of modulation space to work with. Every product in Wisconsin has to have 7.5 CFM per person, regardless of the type of space that it is, uh, regardless of the square footage, any of that. They have their own ventilation rate, so it's a little bit different there, but uh, CO2 is allowed in the state of Wisconsin. There are certain things you need to do. If you're having trouble in Wisconsin getting a product approved, let me know. And between myself and um, the Focus on Energy Utility Rebate folks, we can help talk you through that. Chicago is always unique for codes, as you know. Um, usually Chicago sometimes is behind on updating their codes, and they do things the old way. However, when it comes to CO2, they were cutting edge. Uh, they put CO2 demand control ventilation systems in the mechanical ventilation code section back in 2003, which was three years prior to the Inter International Mechanical Code talking about it at all. So we started doing CO2 projects legally in Chicago before uh, any other place at all. The only thing weird about Chicago versus everywhere else in the country, is Chicago actually dictates the part per million rate you cannot exceed at 1,000. For ASHRAE and IMC driven projects, we typically do, do it 700 parts per million above the outdoor air level. And the outdoor air level in the Chicagoland area is usually about 450 parts per million. So that generates an indoor set point of 1150. However, if it's a city of Chicago job, we have to drop that set point down to 1000. So we don't get quite as much savings in the city of Chicago, but we still get substantial savings. Uh, Julian's asking how much energy savings DCV can have compared to a fixed ventilation system. I will show you some calculations toward the end today uh, that will indicate that for you. Uh, so not only is it allowed by the mechanical codes, it is often required now by energy codes for certain applications. 90.1 is our energy standard. It feeds into the IECC, as you know, which feeds into our local codes, including the state of Illinois, where IECC 2015 is required statewide. 
IECC 2012 and 2015 have the same language for code requirements, and that is basically if you have a space occupant density of 25 people per thousand square foot, you're going to need to do a demand control ventilation system. The older codes, 2009, uh, which would be our friends in Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, etc., the density there for requirement was 40 people per thousand square foot. So in 2012, they tightened it up a little bit, which made more spaces have to do it. So it used to be like movie theaters and auditoriums and places like that would have to do it. Uh, now you might fall into situations where conference rooms, classrooms at an office building or something like that may have to do it. There are some exceptions um, where you might not have to do it. For example, if you have a project with an ERV and the ERV is code compliant ERV, you don't have to do DCV. Obviously, if I'm recovering a lot of energy to pretreat my outside air, reducing my outside air doesn't have quite as much of a payback in that case. If you've got old pneumatic VAV systems, you would not have to do it either. Or if you have really small systems, there are some exceptions for some of those. But for the majority of your systems, especially larger buildings, you're going to have to do it. Uh, Carl asks, why is square foot area used instead of cubic feet of volume used for spaces? Uh, that's a great question, Carl. Uh, from a logical, you know, engineering and physics stance standpoint, you want to use the volumetric area. However, that is seldom used in any of the codes. Almost everything is based off of square footage because, well, I don't know exactly why. I'm assuming it's because the, the average person is too stupid to calculate the volume. <laughs> That's all I can think of, Carl. A lot of people know their square footage of a space. None of them know what the volume of the space is, right? Obviously, all they have to do is take the square footage and multiply it by the height, but people don't know that necessarily. Um, and then additionally, do you count the above the ceiling section for a drop ceiling and stuff like that? So they base it on square footage. And probably because most spaces have a typical 10-foot height anyway. Um, but yeah, logically speaking, you'd want it to be cubic volume. Um, CO2 is approximately the same weight as air. Uh, actually, a large portion of air is made up of CO2 anyway. So that CO2 expands equally in all directions. If you're the same weight as the air that you're in, you're going to go left, right, front, back, and up and down. So the taller the space is, the more it'll spread out. Uh, the other thing that could come into play there, Carl, is that typically once you get above six feet above your head, we don't really care what's going on. Um, so the taller the ceiling is, it doesn't really help me as far as my breathing zone. But you're right, the CO2 would spread across those areas. Uh, Tom added a little note in here, I think as a follow-up to Carl, saying 62.1 does account for volumes and spaces with short-term high occupancy loads by a separate modifier calculation. Uh, I'm not looking at that specifically, Tom, but I know you well enough to know that I'm going to believe that. Um, but we can look it up, too. Um, these are all the states that are on uh, 2015 and 2012. Green is the 2015 code. Two, blue is 2012. Uh, additionally, Wisconsin, even though it says 2009, it has a lot of amendments that bring it up closer to 2012. Um, but there's a lot of states that have these codes already in place currently today. All right, question number two. All right. Which codes have requirements for DCV? A, IECC 2009, B, 2012, C, 2015, D, B and C, or E, all of the above? Hopefully everyone gets this right because we literally just talked about this like two minutes ago. All right, we got 77% of the people that have answered. So we'll shut it down in five more seconds. So please pick one of your answers. Five, four, three, two. All right, and we'll share the answers with you. 62% of the people got it correct, which is E, all of the above.
So this is the slide that we had that answer two slides ago. 2012, 2015, 2009 all have requirements for demand control ventilation systems. All right, let's do question number three. Oh, question number three is not in my queue. We will skip question number three. So you get a freebie. We'll assume everyone answered question three correctly because it's not listed in my question queue, which is unfortunate. Unfortunate for me, not, not for you. All right, so sorry about that. You get a free one. So our goal is to ventilate versus actual and assumed occupancy. Stop wasting by overventilating and try to provide some paybacks to people to make this cost attractive option, which is not that hard to do. So this graph is my favorite demand control ventilation graph. In fact, it's my favorite graph of all the classes I teach, and I'm a full-time teacher, so that's saying a lot. I love this chart. It's from, from a building actually in Florida uh, in the late 90s, but every single building that we do has this exact same profile. Every single office building has this exact same profile. So this is an office building. Down in the horizontal axis is midnight to midnight, up the left side is zero ventilation up to 100% of code ventilation. So not 100% of the damper, 100% of the code required amount. So what happens in a normal building is that in the nighttime, everything's, you know, shut down. We're showing a solid bar in this case at uh, 30%, but in reality, it goes zigzag up and down. When the system goes on, off, on, off, it would zigzag up and down. So that's why we're showing it as 30% instead of, you know, 100%, 0, 100, 0, 100, 0. So we're assuming your unit cycles on 30% of the time at night. So you got that, and then once you get the building to go occupied, approximately 7 a.m., in this green area here, we'd open up the ventilation damper to the code required airflow, and it would stay there the entire day, because the fan would run continuously the entire day. And then at, what is it, uh, 6 p.m.-ish or so, 5 p.m.-ish, it would shut down and go back to, you know, nighttime cycling only. The purple graph for the two little mountains that's the exact same building once CO2 sensors are added to the office building. So you can see everybody doesn't come to work at 7. They come in at 8 or they trickle in slightly after 8. Most people make it to work by about 10. Uh, it never goes fully occupied, ever. If you have an office building of a decent amount of occupants, it'll never, ever, ever be 100% occupied. Somebody's always not there. Somebody's sick. Somebody's on vacation. Somebody had to go to do a field job site visit, something like that, customer lunch, whatever. So it never goes fully occupied in any of these buildings. Then around 11 o'clock, people start cutting out early for lunch. About half of them leave the building for lunch, half stay there. Uh, most of them make it back from lunch. Some of them just stay at the bar drinking margaritas, but most make it back. And then by like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, people cut out early to go uh, do a twilight golf or whatever. This is like literally every single office building that we've ever done. We get what we call the two-hump profile um, with the lunch drop in the middle there. This is so predictable. It is literally every office building. Now, if you work in an office that has two people in it, okay, it's not your building. Right? But if you have a decent amount of people, you get that profile. Uh, Federal Energy Management Program, same exact profile from however many buildings they sampled, same two-hump profile in an office building. If you look at the restaurant industry, we get a three-hump profile, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We also get these little, what I call bonus humps. Uh, right after you know lunchtime or whatever, there's like another little hump. That's the people going to lunch at 1 o'clock instead of going at 12. I don't know why people do that. I assume it's because you go to lunch at 12 and they don't like you. So they wait till you come back and then they go. Then they get two hours in a row without seeing your face. I don't something like that. Um, but you always have these little extra bonus humps of people coming, you know, to eat afterwards. Every type of major building has a profile like this, and those profiles typically get loaded into some of the calculation softwares that we use. So you can pick from a drop-down box very easily, and I'll show you in a little while um, a profile for an office or a restaurant or a school and you'll be able to give a quick calculation of how much energy you approximately would save. Oh, Jim has an excellent question. Jim says, I thought code requires outdoor damper to be closed during unoccupied times at night. That is very true, Jim. Um, so in this case, um, the reason we're showing 30% at night is because every time the fan turns on at night for a heating or cooling call, in real life, those dampers are opening. So we're making the assumption in this case that 30% of the hours of the night, the damper is actually opened. Uh, and then the other 70% it's closed, obviously. The code does require it to be shut at night, but I'm going to promise you that almost every product you've ever done, if you've asked for it to be closed at night, it is not being closed. On a DDC system, it probably is happening. On a thermostat-controlled rooftop, I promise you it is not happening. 
because that rooftop economizer controller has absolutely no idea when it's nighttime or unoccupied team time. No idea whatsoever. All the thermostat traditionally tells the rooftop is, I want heating, I want more heating, I want cooling, I want more cooling, and I want fan. There's nothing on normal thermostat that tells the economizer that it's occupied or unoccupied. Now, with that being said, all of the modern economizers for the past 10 years have an input on them waiting for something to tell them that it's occupied time or not. Um, and there are certain thermostats that have an output to be able to do that. Uh, if you need help with that, let me know. I can send you thermostats that can handle that and wiring diagrams and how to connect them. But there's, I don't know, there's got to be about 15, 18 thermostats that can do that. But that's not that many in the grand scheme of things because there's probably hundreds of thermostats that are available on the market. But only a few of them have an occupancy output contact that can be wired up to it. Um, Thad says, I hope I'm joking about people calculating volumetric spaces. Uh, I'm not joking, Thad. Um, you're an engineer, so maybe you're a little different. Most people have no idea um, how to calculate a volume. I'm not joking. <laughs> I, I have that conversation all the time residentially because it's required to calculate volumetric calculations for blower door testing, and a lot of the folks in those classes don't have an idea what I'm talking about. Um, so we'll save that discussion, Tad, for another day. So here's some typical averages that happen in typical uh, environments. So an office building, on average, Adding DCV systems saves about 30% of the energy, um, basically saying 30% of the time your building's not occupied, right? So that's everything on this graph that's between the purple and the green area. Um, and that's pretty plausible that everybody's not at their office. Um, retail is a much more massive savings, uh, about 90% savings on retail. That's because those retail spaces are being sized, uh, you know, for whatever, you know, Black Friday or whatever it is, um, whatever their busiest time is. But the rest of the time, nobody's there. I mean, Black Friday, you know, at Walmart compared to, you know, 3 a.m. at Walmart, it's a l largely different amount of people. There's people at Walmart at 3 a.m. There are just not a lot of them, and they're a little bit odd. Uh, I know I used to work there. Um, restaurants, same kind of thing. It's a large amount of savings available, 90% savings potential, because at a restaurant, it's designed for whatever Saturday night dinner crowd. But at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, there's not a lot of population in there. Schools is, is the interesting one. Um, there's a massive savings shown here, uh, 70%, which seems kind of unfeasible. There's several things at, at work here, but the major thing is that each kid can only be in one room at a time. If the gym, the library, the lunchroom, the classrooms are all designed for 100% occupancy, which they are, uh, those systems turn on and they run all day whether someone's in there or not. So when your kids, your class leaves your classroom and goes to PE, your classroom is still running and ventilating. Right? And then they come back to the classroom, then they go to recess, then they go to lunch, then they go to the classroom. Right? If we know which rooms they're in, we can shut off the ventilation or modulate it back when they're not in those rooms. But a normal system doesn't know that, so we overventilate all those spaces in the school. Additionally, the classroom is probably designed for 30 or 35 kids. If you only have 27 kids this year, the system is not told that. No one goes in and rebalances it every year once they get the class rosters. So there's a little bit of that there too. But the vast majority of it is people moving around the space, around the building being in different rooms all the time. Uh, typical return on investments, uh, typically always under a year and a half. Uh, the key is to find building types that have a large requirement of outside air and people that are coming and going, right? So if you're, uh, whatever, if you're a 911 call center for a village or whatever, you probably aren't a good candidate for DCV because those people better be there in the building on the phones waiting to take those calls, right? So the population doesn't change much, so it's not a good candidate, but schools are good. Theaters are one of the absolute best. AMC Theater started doing this 15 years ago because they realized how much money could be saved here. Um, so there's lots of case studies, lots of things showing you how much money you can save. This is a really big project, so it's kind of nice to show the dollar amounts, saving $130,000 for half a year, but most people don't have buildings that big. Uh, these are early adopters, people that started doing this 15 plus years ago uh, with, with successful in installations. Um, we have pages and pages and pages of these now. There's literally thousands and thousands of buildings that have demand ventilation systems in the United States. All right, so how do we actually control this and how do we set it up? Um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, so, but just to kind of get you an idea. So we've got to decide if CO2 is appropriate for that particular building. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but the type of space usage is important. The ventilation load is important. If there are any special pressurization needs, so like in a hospital 
ICU area, you're not going to be doing this, right? Because they have special pressurization between the zones. So you're not going to start messing with the intake area and messing up that pressurization. But offices, schools, retail, all good candidates. We've been using this chart for an extremely long time. Um, you can tell we've been using it a long time because the font is really old and it says, you know, things like, you know, disco and stuff like that. So um, it's a pretty old chart. But this is good candidates for CO2-based demand control ventilation. A means it's a good idea, C means it's a horrific idea, and B means we should probably talk about it a little bit more. All right, so for example, places that are good candidates, um, classrooms like we said, music rooms, libraries, auditoriums, theaters, um, any type of indoor sporting arena, office buildings, uh, retail sales floor areas, malls. Um, we tend to stay away from the hospital stuff, but there are areas you can do it, like lobbies, waiting areas, cafeteria type stuff at the hospital is fine. Uh, hotels are really good candidates, especially in the conference area of the hotel. They might have a conference going on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but nothing on the weekend or something like that. So those are good lobbies at the hotels, meeting rooms, um, game rooms, gymnasiums are good. There it is, ballrooms and discos, fantastic application for those discos, bowling alleys, movie theaters, etc. Ones that are bad are the C's, guard station at a prison. Obviously, the people better be at work manning the guard station, so there should never be a fluctuation of population. Um, locker rooms, locker rooms smell horrific now. Kids shove their hockey gear in there for three months without washing it, so changing the ventilation rate in there is probably not the best idea, um, so that's a bad application. Kitchens are good applications for DCV, but not good applications for CO2-based DCV. There are DCV systems specifically for kitchen cooktops, uh, but they are different types of systems than we're talking about today. Same thing with garages. Great applications for DCV, demand control ventilation, but we don't track CO2 in those cases. We track CO, carbon monoxide, which is what the cars quote unquote exhale, or we track carbon monoxide plus NO2, nitrogen dioxide, which is what a diesel vehicle would be interested in tra tracking. Pet shops are bad, just like locker rooms. They already smell. Don't mess around with those. Um, places that have ventilation needs, paint booths, um, FDA processing facilities, stuff like that we don't mess with. Uh, warehouses are not good candidates. Um, there's like three dudes working in the warehouse, um, and it's a huge volumetric space, so we can't measure you in there if we wanted to. Uh, we stay away from the medical stuff typically. Uh, autopsy rooms and mortuaries we don't do. Uh, if you don't know why, then we'll all just chuckle about it in the back. Um, obviously, if you're dead, you're not breathing. Swimming pools because of the chlorine, right? So places where the ventilation need is dictated by something other than just people, we don't mess with it, all right? Or places where the population never changes, we don't mess with it. The bees are the maybes, right? And the reason they're maybes is because you got to tell me what's going on. So like dining rooms and cafeterias, those are maybes. Those are really good applications if the dining room has its own ventilation system separate from the kitchen. However, sometimes people design the makeup air to be brought in through the dining room units, suck through the doorway, and into the makeup air unit, or to the, excuse me, to the exhaust unit. If that's the case, then it would not be a good candidate. But if the dining room is properly decoupled from the kitchen, then the dining room area becomes a good candidate for DCV. The other ones that are maybes are like florists, furniture stores, beauty salons, stuff like that. They have lots of chemical usage in them, and we need to know specifically what's going on and what chemicals we're talking about before we start touching ventilation rate type stuff. Um, bedrooms are bad, bad candidate as well. I get tons of questions, specifically from utilities wanting to do this in multifamily living. I'm like, dude, you have a two-bedroom apartment with two people living in it. I can barely sense you breathing in there. Uh, so not a good candidate. Casinos are a great candidate, but they used to be a maybe because of the smoking. But now most states don't allow the smoking, so they probably should switch to the A category now. Um, there's our two-home profile. What we need to do is establish a new base ventilation rate. So that top line, the 100% line, that's our co-required designed ventilation rate. I need to pick a new minimum that I'm allowed to go down to. We used to sort of do this randomly and say, oh, 20, 30% sounds great. Um, with the code changes in 2004 and 2006, it really made it crystal clear. As you know, we said earlier, they separated the code into two pieces, a per person and a per square foot portion of it. And the reason for doing that was specifically for demand control ventilation. The per square foot portion of it becomes our baseline. And then our maximum, or our regular code minimum, if you will, is the additive portion. So now we know exactly how far we can modulate back and still be within the code rules. So it's very clear now on how to do that. I'm going to skip a few of these in the interest of time because they're just kind of 
going in more detail on the control side of it. Let's do the uh, question number four here. Which of the below might be the best application for CO2 DCV amongst this list? Commercial kitchens, schools, condo buildings, or warehouses? This one is a total gimme, so I expect like 99% accuracy here. We just talked about it. Uh, Mike asked a question, is DCV akin to diversity of load calculation? Uh, it is not. Your load calculation will not change because of a DCV system. Your load is still based on the worst case scenario, which is everybody showing up to work at the building and being fully occupied. Um, what DCV does is allows you to operate your system below all of your engineering design calculations for ventilation and all that stuff um, when everybody doesn't show up to the building. But it doesn't affect your load calculation at all. Not one bit. All right, 82% of you voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close it in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 96% of you got it correct and said a school would be the best application amongst these four. Obviously, the commercial kitchen doesn't have a lot of CO2 production, and the needs for ventilation are dictated by the stove. Condo building does not have dense occupancy, nor does a warehouse. All right, so let's go ahead and hide that down. Um, levels that are normally acceptable, uh, like I said, for current ventilation codes and SRA 62, we're trying to be about 700 parts per million above the outdoor air rate. In this area of the country, it's typically around 450, 475, something like that. So set 450 plus 700 is 1150 will be your typical set point. If you look at this particular chart, 1150 gets me um, between the ideal and marginal rates on what would have been an old, you know, 15, 12 CFM per person type rate. If you're doing City of Chicago, you're going to end up with 1,000 parts per million, which is right kind of in that ideal range. Um, so you're kind of in the same ballpark either way. So that would be dictating what our sub points are going to be. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can control this. This one is set point relay control. This is what Chad was probably referring to previously. I have in my slides just to pick on it. Um, in the olden days, if you will, you know, more than 15 years ago, before we could fully modulate these dampers based on the CO2 signal, the CO2 sensor would be set for some maximum limit, say 1,200 parts per million. If you hit that limit, the CO2 sensor would close a relay and tell the air handler, oh crap, things are really bad here, bring me more outside air, and the damper would go from its new base minimum back up to its code ventilation minimum for that period of time. If it was improperly set up, someone might have set it up to let it go 100% wide open instead of 100% of ventilation, right? Um, so that would have been an issue there. We don't do it that this way anymore, and we have, I haven't done it this way in the past two decades at all. Um, a better choice would be proportional control or proportional integral derivative control, PID loop. Um, so in this case, we're showing one with you know a range of 500 to 1,100 parts per million, and that modulates us between the base ventilation rate, which is our new lower minimum, basically to take care of building pressurization needs and stuff like that, back up to our design ventilation rate, which is our old code, code minimum ventilation. And then as we go between 500 and 1100, we can modulate in between those two points. Or you can do a full PID loop, which is just like this straight linear line, except it has a corrective factor to take into account how fast you're getting to the goal, right? So just like we do for hot water valves and chill water valves and um, mixed air dampers for that matter, um, we can modulate with a PID loop, which is a little bit better than proportional. So set point control, bad, never do this. This will lead to return callback problems every single time. Proportional control, perfectly acceptable. PID, a little bit better. If you got a DDC system, you can kind of go this route. CO2 sensors should be mounted on the wall, uh, four to six feet above the floor. Uh, basically mount them the same place you mount a thermostat. Um, just like with a thermostat, you don't want it mounted by the exterior wall. Thermostat for solar reasons, the CO2 sensor for window leakage reasons. So keep it next to the thermostat on an interior wall, next to the door or whatever, something like that. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Resist the temptation to put them in the return duct. Everyone wants to do that. There are numerous reasons why that's bad. The first of which is your return duct is probably leaky. 
So it is sucking air in from places that are not the room itself. It's sucking in from the ceiling cavity and exterior walls and other zones. So you're getting a diluted number to begin with. The other thing is if you're going to do this on a VAV system, you absolutely positively cannot put it in the return duct. Because I need to know what's going on in each zone and modulate that zone independently. If I put one in the return duct and average it, for example, let's say I have an office building with 10 offices surrounding a conference room. If all 10 of us are in our office, we're getting a certain ventilation rate. If we all leave our office and go into the conference room, the return CO2 sensor will read the exact same thing it read earlier because it's still just the same 10 people. But our VAV boxes will all be reacting differently because they're reacting to temperature only. You cannot put it in the return duct for a zone system. It has to be in every single zone. Um, with that being said, there are a couple applications where the return duct might make sense. Specifically, it might make sense like in the school gymnasium. You don't even have a ceiling to begin with, so any return duct leakage is still coming from the room, and anything you put in the wall gets smashed. But other than that, you're going to want to put it on the wall. In some cases, like in the case of uh, you know, a lead project, uh, if you're trying to go for that credit that involves a CO2 sensor, you're required to put it on the wall, and you're prohibited from putting it in the return duct. Some utility programs are the same way. I know off the top of my head, Focus on Energy prohibits you from putting it in the return duct and getting a rebate because they understand some of these things I just explained. So put it on the wall generally handle about 5,000 square feet of open space. If the walls are partitioned, you need sensors in each section of the partitions. Uh, so that's kind of the, you know, the rules on that kind of thing. Um, we'll skip along a little bit because we talked about some of this stuff already. All of the modern economizers do have this input. Uh, these are all Honeywell economizer controllers because they make the vast majority of them for all manufacturers. If you didn't know, Honeywell two years ago eliminated all of these models. And the only one they make is that first one, W7220, and that one does accept CO2, as do the 7212 series, uh, which was the predecessor. So everything you bought recently on rooftops with a Honeywell controller can handle this kind of stuff. All right. Um, it's not a new thing. It's been around forever. It's been in the engineer's handbook. Um, it's always been kind of targeted around that 1,000 parts per million number. Um, we get a little bit more aggressive with the modern ASHRAE stuff, but it still kind of hovers around that 1,000 parts per million goal. Um, so it's been, it's, it's literally now a 100 year old concept. It's just that in the past we didn't really have the controls to handle it until we got to the 1990s. Then the control systems were able to handle the logic that we already knew. The ventilation rates in ASHRAE 62 dating back to 1989 have always been based on demand control ventilation data. Or specifically I should say they've been based on CO2 ventilation data. That's how these things have been set up. That's how the ventilation rates were previously determined based on that research data. It's just that we never told anyone that until, you know, 15 years later. All right, so the reason it's more popular now is the cost of the sensors has been reduced and the reliability has increased and the, la and the lack of calibration need has increased. So cost has gone down considerably. You can get a CO2 sensor for two, three hundred bucks. It's going to take somebody in a typical office building to take them a couple hours to install it, right? So you're talking about something that's going to probably cost you 800 bucks or something like that as an end user. Uh, most of the manufacturers design them for a 15-year lifespan. The two main manufacturers have 10-year calibration guarantees. Um, that little piece that guy's holding in the picture is what I would call the engine. There's manufacturers of CO2 sensors all over the place. There's like 15 of them. But most of them get their engine, if you will, from one of two manufacturers of the, of the guts. And those people have automatic calibration routines. So what that means is that every night these sensors recalibrate themselves automatically. You need to only be unoccupied about four hours a week for that to actually happen. Uh, what happens in most buildings is once everyone leaves the building, the leakage through the building structure, um, the leakage through the building structure uh, allows the indoor and outdoor CO2 rates to, to equalize. The CO2 rates outdoors do not change. At least they don't change on a daily basis. They change, you know, every few years, right? Over the course of time, CO2 levels in the, in the world have been increasing. But on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month or even year-to-year -year basis, there's really no change. So the sensors read what the outside air level is if the building is unoccupied long enough, and they constantly retweak themselves to that level, They're constantly just changing their baseline. So they self-calibrate, and that calibration is a 10-year process where it's guaranteed by the manufacturer. So if on year 8 your sensor drifts out of calibration, they give you a new one. In fact, most of them don't even have a calibration button anymore. They took the button off of there because if there's a button on something, people press it blindly without hooking a can up to it. Um, so it was easier to take the button off and not even allow you to recalibrate it. 
Um, what I'm talking about is commercial grade CO2 sensors for you know office buildings and stuff like that. If you're an industrial manufacturing facility and you need CO2 for other reasons, there are just a totally different category of products that handle that kind of thing. In any case, here's three sensors sitting on the wall side by side for about a week. Uh, they start out a little bit far apart and they eventually calibrate and tweak themselves to be essentially the same number. Most manufacturers have a uh, accuracy rating of about plus or minus 50 parts per million. Here's those same three kind of sensors over two weeks. And here's three sensors sitting on the wall for, what would that be, three years, um, basically constantly tweaking themselves next to each other. Um, so it's a pretty reliable uh, situation. So you don't need to calibrate these at all. All right, let's do the final question here. So final question, and gosh, we just mentioned it, so like really this is just to see if you're alive. True or false, all CO2 sensors need annual calibration. Uh, Jeff asked, how do we ensure the correct concentration of OA to total supply air is delivered to a high-density room when, the fully when fully occupied if DCV for the system is reducing the OA concentration in the supply air? Well, if the space is actually fully occupied, Jeff, um, it wouldn't be the, the outdoor level would not be reduced. It would be back up to its design code airflow. Um, on a zone by zone basis, what happens though is that the damper, the zone VAV damper modulates more open if the CO2 in that room needs it. If that CO2 level cannot be reached, that VAV box will communicate its needs to the air handler. Um, what, what we do when I program building automation, because that was my former life, um, we would send the highest CO2 reading from any of the VAV boxes to the air handler and have the air handler modulate off of that. If I can get the highest zone down to the level that it needs to be at, obviously all the other zones will be down to the level that they need to be at. Uh, other manufacturers might do it a little bit differently, but that's how I traditionally have done it. All right, I'm going to close this poll right now. Uh, so true or false, all CO2 sensors need annual calibration. The correct answer is false. 87% of you got that correct. All right. We got about five more minutes of stuff, and then we're going to be all wrapped up for you guys here. So some people asked about uh, cost savings. Uh, this is a software tool that Honeywell puts out. It's a free tool. Uh, it's for thermostats, economizers, or demand control ventilation, or all of them together. I tend to use this tool for two reasons. One, it's what I call a five-minute tool, and I am lazy, and I like to do things that don't take a lot of time. And two, is it that if I want to calculate how much it's savings I'm going to have by retrofitting economizers, stats, and demand ventilation on the same project. I don't want to use a tool that calculates those, you know, calculate the stat, another tool to calculate the economizer, another to calculate the DCV, and then add them together. It's going to tell me that I'm going to save like 80% of my utility costs, which is obviously not accurate. There's interactions with these things. If I put the system on a programmable thermostat, it's obviously going to run less, so hence less benefit for DCV and so forth, right? So this tool is nice because it takes into account all of those things. Uh, in this case, this was a Chicago system. I think it was a 10-ton rooftop based on 2,000 level of construction. It's a pretty simple tool. We have more robust tools as well, like you know, HAP and stuff like that. But this one's quick and easy. So you, you just give it that basic info. What city are you in? What kind of construction is it? What kind of system efficiency do you have, you know, your rooftop efficiency? What's your general occupancy? If you don't know, you can pick one of those template profiles I was talking about earlier, the two-home profile and stuff like that. What are your utility costs? And then hit calculate and it'll spit out a screen like this. In this case, I told it I didn't have anything, no programmable stat, nothing. So it's telling me this particular system is going to save $1,700 by putting a setback programmable thermostat on. Uh, if I put a dry bulb economizer up to 18, enthalpy 1859, differential enthalpy, I'm up to 2000. If I do DCV, $1,862. And then, you know, DCV with economizer, additions, blah, blah, blah. Right? So basically, in this particular product, I'm going to say about eight, oops. 1800 bucks, and that was based on, I think, $0.60 cents a therm, $0.12 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, if it cost me 800 bucks to have a sensor installed, and then my savings is 1800 bucks, obviously my payback is like five months, right? The reason the payback says zero on here is because you saw I did not put an equipment cost on there. Um, I didn't do that because I used the same thing all over the country and everything varies. 
but around here it takes about 800 bucks to install it. The more sensors you install on a project at the exact same time, the less it's going to cost you per sensor, right? Because half the cost of any product is getting somebody driven to the site, mobilized, ladders out of the truck, all that kind of stuff. So whether they're doing one sensor or five sensors, the cost per sensor you know, goes down. But the paybacks can be really quick for a lot of these projects. And certainly under a year is, is very common. In this particular case, it was under a half a year. Uh, if we have BAV systems, there's a different tool that I use because this Honeywell one can only handle single zone systems. Um, this one from uh, Carrier and uh, Telair has a similar one. You can do multiple zone systems as well. And then if you're really detailed and you want, like, you know, really detailed reporting, you can use Carrier HAP or Train Trace or one of those programs to do a, do a more detailed model. But those are going to have to model the whole building structure as part of that discussion. So these tools are really good to see if something's feasible. You know, it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And then if you need, like, robust engineering calculations, after this tool gives you a thumbs up, then maybe you want to go ahead and, and do a more detailed calc. There are rebates for this, as I had promised. Um, this was recently added back into the NICOR program for um, businesses, for commercial facilities. Um, the rebate is $150 per sensor, right? So if it was costing me $800 before, now it's only going to basically cost me $650. So now my payback you know, becomes a three-month payback on that, on that previous product I showed you here. So it helps change the payback to make the product more attractive to people. Um, there are a few rules on that. You've got to be doing it as an energy conservation measure. Um, you have to be doing it on an existing uh, facility. This is not eligible for new construction because a lot of new construction facilities have to do it for code required purposes anyway. But you've got an existing rooftop or air handler. You want to save some energy. Um, you can add a CO2 sensor uh, and get a rebate from NICOR. Um, if you need more details on how that whole program works, let us know. We can certainly help you with that. Additionally, in addition to NICOR, there are other rebates available. So that same CO2 sensor you just put on the wall, got your 150 bucks from NICOR, you could also get a rebate from ComEd, which for most people that have NICOR, they probably have ComEd as their electric utility. Not always, but usually. Uh, the way the ComEd one works is $0.04 cents per square foot is the rebate. So that same project, I believe, was 10,000 square feet, right? So 10,000 square feet. I'm super lazy. I'm going to use my calculator. I'd have another $400 rebate from ComEd in that case. So I'd get $400 plus the $150, so I'd have a $550 rebate on something that was costing me $800 or something like that. So $250 cost. So now my payback is like, like a month or a month and a half or whatever. So it can help really buy it down. Uh, the Air Care Plus program from ComEd also has it on there. It's $450 per rooftop. Only certain contractors are involved in that program. It's a whole rooftop tune-up type program uh, where they – go in and clean coil and stuff like that and um, improve the efficiency of your rooftop. But as part of that program, there are enhancements you can add on, like a programmable thermostat, or in this case, CO2 sensor, economizer, something like that. Public utilities, as you know in Illinois, do not get their rebates through the ComEd NICOR type channel. They get it from DCEO, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. That program went on a hiatus last year and was not active. However, it is relaunching tomorrow uh, via webinar. And... Uh, and the um, rates for CO2 are extremely high. It's 14 cents for uh, gas systems and 6 cents for electric. So if you have a packaged rooftop unit with gas and electric, it ends up being a 20 cent per square foot rebate, uh, which is pretty substantial. And that office building example we just did, where I say 10,000 square feet times 20 cents, um, that's not right. What did I just do? And why am I using a calculator? Uh, $2,000 rebate, so like it pays for the whole entire thing. Boom, done. It's a free sensor. It's literally free. You just got to do some paperwork. You might want to do paperwork for one sensor, but if you're going to retrofit a bunch, this makes a lot of sense. For our friends in neighboring states, Wisconsin has a robust program for CO2 as well. Um, if you do it on a packaged rooftop unit, it's $350 rebate. Um, and if you do it on other systems like an air handler, it's $0.20 cents per outside air CFM. So they didn't go the square foot route. They went the CFM route. Uh, NIPSCO is 11.5 cents if you have NIPSCO gas, uh, and then in Michigan, it's uh, 5 cents uh, for most of the gas utilities up there. As mentioned, there are other applications for DCV other than CO2 people-based ones. There are parking garages and kitchen stove exhaust systems, so some of the utilities in the area uh, have rebates for that. It's generally based on the horsepower of the fan, but you can retrofit those type of systems on there and get pretty decent rebates for that as well, just not CO2 related. 
There are other ways to save energy with determining occupants being there or not. Occupancy sensors are one of those. Uh, we use these sometimes in classrooms. It's kind of like everyone's in the classroom or they're not. So we might have an occupancy sensor that turns on the lights and changes the set points from occupied to unoccupied for the unit vent or whatever they have, VAV box, et cetera. Um, so we can do that kind of stuff. Hospital hospitality industry does a lot of stuff with the key cards um, or a master switch type thing. Uh, if you have an office building that has security where you got to swipe in and out with a key fob, when you swipe out, we can send your VAV box for your particular office back into the unoccupied mode to save energy. Um, there's thermostats that can be activated when lights turn on, the thermostat goes on. Um, lights go off, the thermostat goes back to unoccupied, so you don't have to ever program it. Uh, and then there's window locks as well. If you open up your window, it breaks the window lock, and we then disable your VAV box. There's lots of ways to do these occupancy-based things to change your energy costs at your building. CO2 uh, for ventilation is just one of those types of options. So with that, do we have any further questions? Tom has asked for the link for the Honeywell calculation tool. Um, I can definitely do that. Uh, I, sadly, the easiest way, Honeywell's website is just beastly. The easiest way is to Google Honeywell, Honeywell Economizer software. Um, just That's just the way it is. So if I do that, Honeywell Economizer software, the first thing that comes up is Economizer Savings Estimator. Click on that one, and then from there I can download it. You install it on your computer. It's a really small program. It doesn't take up a lot of space or anything like that. But you can download it from there, unzip it, and install it. That's probably the easiest way to do that, Tom. Uh, Will asks, is the AirCare Plus a program through NICOR or a different utility? AirCare Plus is a program through, uh, through ComEd. Uh, so ComEd runs that particular program. Uh, so it's mainly a cooling-based type program. Uh, but if you put a CO2 sensor in, you can get the com the AirCare Plus rebate for that, and you can still go get the $150 rebate from NICOR as well. Um, AirCare Plus is run for ComEd by ClearResult, and ClearResult happens to run the NICOR utility programs, so there is a lot of, you know, we want to say synergies between those groups, but it is a little bit different. Um, Does anybody else have any other questions we have not yet answered? Uh, Scott asks if Ameren has the same programs. I am not as familiar with Ameren as other utilities. Um, I didn't even spell it right. We can look that up. So while other people are asking questions, I'll look that up. So I'm going to stay online here for another two, three minutes. If anybody types any more questions in, I will do my best to answer those. And in the meantime, uh, I'll try to find the Ameren program. Ameren, Illinois. Save money. And I know Ameren has a utility program. I just don't know if, if CO2 is on it specifically. Uh, Probably under, well, we've got a couple places we can look here. And make it very easy. So here's the Ameren one. The Ameren one is $150 per sensor. So it is actually in sync with the Nikkor one. All right, so if there are no other questions, it looks like there are not any other questions this time, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and shut the webinar.